Is that already recording? So thanks again no. for the invitation. Sorry. I'm going to talk about completely different subject from what we started this morning. We're going to talk about viruses. Okay. That's the first thing. Okay. So uh, the summary of some part of the part that I'm presenting today was featured uh, in National History Magazine the introduction of this uh, article, uh, the name of the article was a fearful symmetry. This is a common old virus. Um, this virus, like many other spherical viruses, has um, a structure with icosahedral symmetry. I will talk about these viruses and their structure more. But I would like to read to you one communication between the uh, senior editor and editor-in-chief when I was involved in the editing of the article. So the only, first the article is started, the next time you are in bed with flu, give a thought to the remarkable geometry of the virus that caused it. <laughs> Maybe if you have fall, that's the last thing you want to think about. So editor-in-chief wrote, I am not sure I would be in any mood to have my geometry then. <laughs> and um, now the article starts to anyone in bed with a bad cold, the knowledge that the rhinovirus thing, but this is a rhinovirus, the cold virus. A uh, remarkable geometry is probably a little humble physicist problem of great interest. So this is the part today. Why is geometry and this is um, of great interest to physicists? Um, so this is a virus. Um, is the light still Oh, yeah. Um, so this is, um, the simplest viruses are made of a genome which can be either RNA or DNA and a protein shell which is called capsid. Capsid protects the genome for, because the virus infects the cell and goes from one cell to another and it's pretty adverse condition so the, the role of capsid is to protect the genome. So you already see that uh, viruses are really the simplest physical objects in biology. Um, I started the, the talk in the living matter, and the first speaker, however, I'm talking about something that is very controversial when it comes to life. Um, you know, the concept of a virus and organism challenges the way we define life, because um, viruses, they don't, uh, they don't need food, they don't metabolize food, they don't breathe, they don't grow, um, they don't have a cell, and actually they, they can't even move on their own. They only undergo ground and motion in solution. However, they reproduce. And um, more importantly, they evolve. So therefore, depending on how you define life, you can say viruses are alive or not. Um, to reproduce, they need a cell membrane. So this is, uh, the host, this is the membrane of a cell host. So this is the virus. This is the ligand on virus attaches to the receptor on the cell membrane. This is the cell membrane. And then the cell membrane engulfs the virus, and um, the virus is a stem cell. All these processes are not well understood. They don't know what happens that the virus is a stem cell inside the cell. So after this assembly starts using our machinery and produce more genome. So it uses our system, our machinery, and produce more genome, and produce more um, protein, and it produces protein subunits that it needs. So again, this process of assembly, that how the viruses assemble in their cell, is not well understood either. They don't know how it happens. So depending on the type of viruses, some viruses, you know, exit the cell the same way that as they came in. Others, they lost the cell. I mean, the cell burst and the viruses are going to be released, as is shown in this picture. So this is a, a generalized uh, a productive life cycle of a virus how it enters and how it reproduces. In general, there are two types of, um, type of capsids uh, classified according to their shape. They are either cylindrical or spherical. This is, uh, this is a very famous virus, tobacco mosaic virus. This virus was um, reproduced in vitro over 50 years ago. In vitro, I mean in the lab. They, they mix the purified proteins of the virus and they put the genome then fully infectious particle form. 50, uh, 12 years later, the, the, in the first spherical virus was reconstituted. Again, this is amazing. You put the genome in the solution, and then you put the protein subunits in solution, and let's say 20 minutes later, you have fully infectious viral particle. 
Um, for complete recycled charcoal. So purely self-assembled. You just you just self-assemble the protein coat around the, 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 the nucleic acid. Yeah, I will talk about it more because actually not only they self-assemble spontaneously around the genome, they will have a very beautiful symmetry. So I will talk about the symmetry that they have, and this process is spontaneous. That's what. How, how did they know about the genome in 1955? Um, you know, they disassembled the virus, and I guess they put them back together, and they started, and they started two infections because they injected the particle to the back of the plant, and they saw that it infects the, the virus. But they were, but it was important that they were, they were able to. Uh, to make the virus again from scratch. But they, they just didn't know what was they were really seeing on. Did you have to make it go to For completeness, I put this picture because I'm going to talk about HIV more at the end of this talk. But uh, I said that we have a spherical and uh, rod lock shape virus. Actually, HIV has conical shape. And even in case of this virus, it's an RNA virus again. They, they mix the protein subunits of prepared protein with the genome in solution, and again, fully infectious particle form. And one important thing is that HIV, many, many animal viruses, but like HIV, they have an additional component, that's a lipid membrane surrounding the virus, so this, uh, which helps the virus to get into the cell and exit the cell. But I will talk about the assembly of HIV later in this talk. So all these things shows us that, you know, if the proteins are positively charged and the, and the genome is negatively charged, and that's why they assemble, the protein assemble around the genome. Now if instead of genome, you have another cargo which is negatively charged, it's possible to assemble, you know, encapsulate the cargo. And then the virus knows, each the different viruses know how to get to different cells in, into our body. Therefore, if we want to send something into specific cells in our body, I mean, viruses are, are, are very good candidates. Actually, they have already started using viruses for, um, for drug delivery and for gene delivery. So, and the most important thing is that they stand wide range of pH, temperature, salt concentration, and pressure. So that's why they are very useful for bio, bio nanotechnology applications. Physics of virus assembly is very rich. Um, and there are so many questions you can ask. For example, I've showed you that the viruses assemble spontaneously. This is only true in case of RNA viruses. DNA is, is, is much stiffer than RNA, as you cannot see this step assembly in vitro. So there are many questions we can answer. What mechanism control virus assembly? Um, uh, can we control and interfere with it? What material can be encapsulated? I'm gonna only answer, try to answer two of them today. One is that what is the original icosahedral symmetry? Um, and then I don't know if I will have time to talk about what the term is the size of the but I definitely like to talk about a wide capsid of HIV as of conical structures. Because the reason that this HIV has a conical structure is completely different. Why um, spherical capsid as of the structure with icosahedral cement. So I'd like to remind you, because I'm going to talk a, a lot about icosahedral symmetry, I'd like to remind you of the elements of icosahedral symmetry. Um, you know, this is an icosahedron, it has 20 identical uh, equilateral triangles, so if they, we have 15 to 4 rotation axis going from in the middle of each edge. It has 10 3 4 rotation axis going through the middle of each triangle, and it has 6 5 4 rotation axis going through each vertex. So, as is shown, through the middle of each uh, edge, and 10 through the middle of each triangle, and 6 through each vertex. But in addition, an icosahedron, there, is, there are many other structures which have the structure with icosahedral symmetry, like a soccer ball. If you look at these elements that I showed you here, you see that the soccer ball has 15 to 4 rotation axis going through the middle of each edge, 10 to 4 rotation axis going through the middle of each hexagon, and 6 going through the middle of each pentagon. Okay, these are cryotinium images. These are like photos of viruses. These are cryo, um, um, 
Trigoti images of viruses. This is, vi this is a herpes virus. This is about 125. The, the diameter of this virus is 125. It's a DNA virus. If you look at here, this is CCMV that I told you. It was the first spherical virus which was uh, reconstituted in vitro. We have common cold virus. It's not clear here. Um, this is polyoma. Uh, this virus, adenovirus that we infect us. So we have different kinds of viruses here. Some of them are animal viruses. Some of them are plant viruses. The genome, some of them are. Actually, we have some phages. They infect um, bacteria. And then um, some of them have DNA inside. The others have RNA. But there is one common thing among all of them, and that's hypostatic growth symmetry. So if you look at these shapes uh, closely, you see that if you look at the protein, you can, you can find the elements that I told you in the previous uh, uh, um, slide. They all have five-fold axis, three-fold axis, and two-fold axis. So... Is it, is it references? Carbon, what is the main... No, it's, it's, these are just, you know, like protein. It's, 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 they look like very much like the carbon 60, but it's not. These are not covalent bonding. These are just protein solvents made of nitrogen, hydrogen, carbon, but it's not on carbon. And, the, 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 and it's not a covalent bond. It's electrostatic interaction. Okay. Um, Crick and Watson, I mean, you know all them because of the finding the structure of DNA. Two years after they, uh, they discovered the structure of DNA, they wrote a very small but very nice and informative paper in Nature in 1956. And the, the name of the article was The Structure of Small Viruses. Based on very simple physical arguments, they found that uh, they talked about the structure of viruses. They said that, okay, the size of the virus is small. Therefore, the size of the genome should be small. Uh, so if the size of the genome is small, therefore it can code only for one or two types of the protein. So the capsid must be made of many copies of the same protein, because it, it, it can only produce one type of the protein. The viral shell should be symmetric so that it sits in equivalent position, because they are all made of one type of protein, so they have to sit in equivalent position. And the last thing they said that the viral shell should be optimal should have optimal capacity. It means it has the good uh, surface to volume ratio. So, because we want it to have as much as possible the volume and the surface to be as small as possible. So one good candidate for this, that meet all these three criteria, among the platonic solid is icosahedron or its two dodecahedron. And um, if, so, if you want to make a structure with, to, with these three items, icosahedron is a, or dodecahedron are very good uh, candidates. So in fact, the smallest viruses have 60 protein subunits. So this is an icosahedron, <coughs> this is a triangle. So if you, I mean, you can divide it into three equal uh, area and then put a protein at the corner of each one. Then you find this shape, which has 60 protein subunits. Um, this is um, capsid of human papilloma virus. You hear about this virus a lot in the news these days because it's a cancer-causing virus. This virus, this unit in this virus is called um, is called uh, capsomer. In this case, it's called pentomer because it's a grouping of five. It has five protein subunits. So these are pentomers, so we have 12 pentomers of 60 protein subunits like this one. So the, the smallest viruses need 60 protein subunits. So you drew the face of the neural chiral, is that accurate? And it, for this one, they, they are not, I mean, if, later when I show you, you see that they are all, um, yes, they are all chiral. There were mistakes with the face terms. Yeah. And how said it is? Sorry, I didn't know. There's an outside and an inside, right? You can take For this one? If the, each of those triangular faces has an outside and an inside, it's distinguishable also. Question. Oh, no, they don't. 
It seems that they are unique, so there is no answer here. Put your thumb in the middle, you can sort of curl the protein tails. Right. Oh, there might be, there might be chirality. Okay, so now if instead of one protein subunit at the corner of each triangle here, you put four protein subunits, you get larger viruses. So if there are larger viruses, of course, they need more protein subunits. So you get these four, these four virus stores. These four protein subunits, A, B, C, D, they are not sitting now in equivalent positions like before. So before you look at them, you see that they are sitting in identical position. So they are interacting identically. But here, they are no longer interacting identically. So A and B and C, they are not sitting in identical position, but they say that they are sitting in the quasi-equivalent positions. So Casper and Kluge introduced the idea of quasi-equivalent and triangulation number, which is equal to the number of equivalents in equivalent sites. So in this case, the number of equivalent sites is four, so that's why the T number, T is equal to four. But you cannot, I mean, we can have, um, we cannot have any T number. So T should be a multiple of 60 such that T is equal to H squared plus K squared plus HK with H and K both integers. Yes? Is this sort of just the same type of protein inside of the subunit or you might have different types of protein? So, I mean, you have, you have, you have different types of protein in the same lab as well, like you, right? I mean, one subunit can have one type or you might have different types. You can have, like, let me show you in some, for example, HIV or omega of the same type of some units, but characters they have four different different types of subunits. So it depends on the virus. CCMB that I'm gonna show you it has on the one type. But it's important that even it's one type of subunits they are sitting in in the equivalent position. So let me tell you more about H and K. Um, this is H axis, this is K axis, so uh, we said that T is equal to H squared plus K squared plus HK. So if you want to make a polyhedral shell from a hexagonal sheet, I mean, it's not possible unless you introduce um, pentagon in appropriate places. So let's say in this picture, if you introduce a pentagon here, here, and then make, make go one unit along the H axis, make a six, rotate 60 degree and go one unit along the K axis and make another Pentagon, and if you keep doing that, you can make this shape, and then you fold it back, which has the symmetry of the soccer ball. So you see that T equal H square K square H K. So H here is one, K is equal to one because you introduce one here and one there. So this is a T equal three, which is the same as the soccer ball. In all cases, according to Euler's theorem, we know that. We need 12 defects here. You have 12 pentomers and 10 times 10 minus 1 hexomers. So um, this is the CCMB that I told you. T is equal to 3 here, and she equal 1, K equal 1, as I said. So these are all protein subunits. There's only one type of protein subunits, but as you can see, the blue and red and green are sitting in, the, uh, in, in they are sitting in, in, in equivalent positions. So the symmetry of this virus is the symmetry of um, the soccer ball. And that's amazing that again when you mix the genome of this, this uh, virus with the protein subunit, these shapes form spontaneously in vitro. Here is some more examples of Casper and Kluge structure. So in all cases you have 12 pentomers, but you have 10 times T minus 1 hexomers. So here is a T equal one, here is a pentagon, here is another pentagon, so here you have one, 12 pentagon no hexagon. As you go, as the T number increases, the number of pentomers remains 12, but the number of hexomers increases, but it's always, um, it's, it's, it's quantized. It means that it has to be always 10 times T minus one. Here you have zero, here you have 20, here you have 30, and here you have 
60 hexons, but in all cases, 12 hexons. Even this is true for a big virus, RNA, DNA virus like herpes. Here you have 12 pentagons and you have 150 he hexagons. So again, this, if you look at here, this is one pentagon, then you go one, two, three, four, you get to another pentagon, so H is equal to four, K equal to zero, and T is equal to 60, which is a very large virus. So now the, the question that arises is that why acrocytical symmetry? And um, so because this process, I mean these viruses, they self-assemble spontaneously, one thing that you know, um, toxic self-assembly must be controlled by free energy minimization. So in order to test that idea, we made a, we said that two kinds of energies should be involved. One is protein subunits aggregates, so there must be an adhesion energy here. And then it's it's forming over the surface of a sphere, it's like there is a curvature energy involved. So we made a very very bold assumption, we said, okay, these viruses, regardless of what they and they are animal or plant viruses, they all are made of pentamers or hexamers. So we model pentamers and hexamers like discs sitting over the surface of a sphere. So this is a virus, this is again CCMV that I showed you before. We assume we model all the pentamers. We focus on pentamers and hexamers, because all viruses are made of pentamers and hexamers. So now a question that is, uh, one can ask is how well can one cover a sphere with non-overlapping non identical surface? So if you want to cover the surface of this with the disk that cover um, the sphere, how, how well can we do that? This is actually a, 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 an old mathematical problem called Thomas problem. Thomas was a Dutch botanist looking at the distribution of pores over the pollen grains and was looking at the distribution and he posed this question. So if you look at the solution of the Thomas problem, you see that uh, with 12 disks, of course we get archosecondal symmetry. This looks like an actual like a dot of any dot. But if you look at other solutions like 32, which can become an archosecondal, you see that it doesn't have archosecondal symmetry. 72 also is another structure we can arrange the disk such that they, they form hypothetical structure. But again, they don't have it. So another question is that why? Why can't we get it here? So we make our model more realistic. We use a softer potential. By softer potential, we said that, okay, this protein attract each other, aggregate, so we need a, a short, we need a long range interaction. And because of excluded volume and overlapping, we need a short range repulsion. So the simplest potential in this form is the Leonard Jones potential. So we, and we said that we assume that the, the pentamers and hexamers are like this sitting over a surface of a sphere. So when they touch each other, the distance from the center to center is sigma. This is where the potential is the minimum, is epsilon naught capsular capsular binding energy. So the distance between two is we call it R, and where the potential is, uh, has its minimum, it's C, where the two disks, they touch each other. So this and this is the amount of potential. You, so you, we said before, in the previous slide, we said there were like 72 did not have icosahedral symmetry. Not in times. That means the, the optimum solution. So now we're trying, so you only like that because now you don't have positive equivalence. Is that right? I see. Right. I don't like it because um, I, I viruses have acrocytical symmetry. That I, need to. I don't like that because I don't have acrocytical symmetry. So I want to see what, why the viruses have acrocytical symmetry. Okay, so I made my model more realistic or I use a softer potential. That was part of this. this is Okay, and there are another components here that viruses have. That they have two different sizes. They have both pentagons and hexagons. So um, we also, in our model, we introduce two different models that you know they are that such that this pentagon and hexagon have the same length. 
So we have, um, and then there is an energy difference between formation of pentagons and pentagons. You probably need some kind of long range interaction, like pull on the other, because these are like phase separation, now we you get a sheet of uh, hexagonal, hexagonal, like, uh, hexagonal lattice, two dimensional, or something like that. But, uh, but the fact that you get this small uh, nuclei, like, the same reason why we don't same for the pentamers or hexamers? How do you... Okay, that's a good question. Here, um, I assume that for, to get this one, I assume that the, uh, the, it's the cost of formation of pentamer and hexamer is the same, and the interaction between them is the same. Now, in the next slide, I show that I change this, that, you know, right now, the, the difference between pentamer and hexamer is the, is the same, but oh, I want to just show you one picture before I answer sure. the question. Sure. So here is 72. You know, this, this, uh, mini, this uh, energy, these points are really, the, the minimum are really big. Because, you know, it's, this is divided by epsilon naught, which is 15 kT. So the difference between each structure and the other one is not just noise, it's pretty pronounced. For example. Excuse me, can I ask one question back on that energy picture? Um, so it would appear to be a prediction that the ones with 42 are less stable. Is that are there fewer structures with 42, or uh, is that maybe not a, a strong? Conclusion? 42 is, is stable. Oh, 
Yeah, well, it is stable, but for example, relative, if I, if I look at sort of the background of defected structures for 42 relative to say 32 or 72, the, the well at 42 is, is uh, not quite as deep in that sense. Right. So are they just as common as 72 or are they, are, are, are they less I common? I know less virus that have 42, but I'm not sure. About okay, the all right. I don't know. You don't know but yourself? Okay, all right. Yeah, Sorry, but, go ahead. Sorry yeah. to interrupt you. But actually, I show that when, I mean, also I talked about this more yeah. in two slides from now. So and when I look at these structures, for example, with 72 plus minus 1, it's 73, you see that there is a large hole here. And so that makes that explains why there is such a big difference. Or if you look at 71, it's quite interesting. You see that everything is there except missing a pentomer. So and that's that's another reason you know you see that there's a, a pretty pronounced energy difference. So now if I ask you a question. So you're calculating free energy, you said. So as these dips, should I think about entropy or should I think about energy exactly. or both or okay, um, you know actually it's better to think about them as energy. Because when I started this, it was I was just looking for the energy minimum and then I realized that the interaction between these capsules is so high that the energy is the dominant. But the, the structure you see are the result of most problems in the nation. But um, But you think that it's the that the entropy is I mean triggered by Dan's question of are there more of this and that? And then I thought about entropy, and that's why I wondered about the role of entropy in the calculation. Right, there, I mean, as I said, these are the result of my problem. But when I calculated the energy, I compared it with the energy coming from this, is very similar. So it's, the level of entropy is not high. Okay. So one more question. Why you don't get a structure where, say, you get, but uh, it's 42 inside, I mean, 12 inside and 42 outside. 12 plus 42, you know, other, other muddy numbers, which are an inner shell and an outer shell. Oh, I have only one shell. But why bio doesn't form this kind of structure? Uh, okay, in, I can tell you in vitro, I don't know about in vivo. But in vitro, uh, first of all, if, if the virus, some viruses, the outer shell is negatively charged, then the virus actually has some around it and it depends on the flexibility of the solids 
So Archimedean solids, they have regular, uh, are made of regular polygons, but of different kind. But each vertex is the equivalent of the other vertex on the, uh, on the shell. So we were wondering, is this unphysical? Why do we have snob cube in our simulation? But then I learned about the self-assembly study of polynoma in vitro. So we see that um, here all capsomers are pentomer, and then changes in pH and ionic strength resulted in T equal 1, snob cube, and T equals 7 structures. But however, I say that in, in vivo, in nature, you can never see snob cube. But this can have only be seen in, uh, in vitro. So thinking about this, I saw this nice work of Albrecht Dewar that it has a snob cube here, and this lady <laughs> sitting there doesn't know. I don't know, it's like me that doesn't know why we have snob cube in vitro, but not in vivo. Just a, just a uh, completely tangential observation that the famous heavy fermion superconductor uranium beryllium 13 has a snub cube of beryllium atoms around the uranium sites. <laughs> so we can make back to the morning after all. <laughs> another, another I can connection. There we go. <laughs> okay, so now I talked briefly about, because I, I like to talk um, about HIV, and I just talked briefly about the these aspherocylindrical uh, uh, viruses. In most phages, they have this shape that is they have cylinder with spherical, with agosahedral caps. But, uh, you know, we repeated our, our simulations uh, to, to try to understand the structure of aspherocylindrical. And then we find, you know, right now, if you see the five fold axis is on the top. And, uh, the, the electron micrographs, it's hard to define actually where the pentomers are sitting. So we repeated our, the, the same study that we did with um, these kind of viruses, and we find that, you know, depending on the number of N, it's possible that you will have five-fold sitting at the top, or three-fold sitting at the top, or two-fold axis even making the, the cap. But now you've done something different, right? Because on the other one, you constrain the number of particles on a spherical shell. Right. And here, the geometry, you have to allow the geometry to be somewhat. And we have one extra lid there. Right? Okay. We have two caps, and then we have, uh, we have the, the cylindrical body. Got it. But so you treat the caps as uh, cylindrical caps, or I'm sorry, spherical caps? A spherical Got caps it. with a cylindrical body. And uh, the reason is that um, I, 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 I'm not going to talk about how a virus chooses its sizes. Mm -hmm. But some viruses, but as you, you change the size of the genome, the size of the shell increases. Okay. And it goes from one alpha-sahedral structure to another. But in case of these viruses, actually, some viruses, they cannot change just the size of their alpha-sahedral shell and they start to become elongated. And this virus, and from the, so what we found that actually from the structure of the cap, uh, so, so you see that the top here, it can have, uh, here the five-fold is on the top, but it's possible that the two-fold to be on the top or three-fold cap to be on the top. But another thing that you find that is, is the system is quantized, flies nicely. So in vitro, and I mean this hopefully help um, the in vitro studies to define the structure of this aspherocylindrical capsule. So for, this is a T equals 7 cap, and it has N equals 72. So as the virus gets larger and larger, we see that it cannot go, I mean you cannot have, for example, just add one more hexamer. The number of hexamers in this case is, has to increase by five. So here you see the difference between the number of hexamers between the structures is fixed and equal to five. The reason it's five is that in order to you, know, you want to add another layer, but you want to keep the symmetry of the cap, so you can only add a multiple of five, and then it gets become elongated. So that's that's what uh, because I, I this study was very similar to the. I was the one, and they only had one extra dimension, which was the length of the cylinder. So I just put it here and show you. This appears in PNAS um, uh, in a few weeks, hopefully. Do you see this picture? No. no. <laughs> uh, I guess I can only come in this direction. So this is the cell assembly of 
We, so well, we can see that one cone-shaped one very well up there. Yeah, on the upper part it shows up yeah, well. I just see if I move it. Is it supposed to be a movie or? No, it does. Uh... But we can see the cone certainly. Yeah, that cone shows up. Oh, 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 yeah. That's... <laughs> well, as you move it, we can see it. Yeah. <laughs> so make a movie out of it. There we go. <laughs>
Yeah. Well, maybe two, maybe two different kinds of proteins. Is that what you're thinking? Yeah, you think of some center of the uh, like this kind of uh, the mm -hmm. No, they are only the identical proteins. The same protein. Uh, uh, let's try to go five minutes until the uh, question time, if you can. Okay. Uh, so here, it, it's just a picture, a more recent picture of, uh, <coughs> from the group. This, you know, these are all, uh, these are 26 uh, structures formed in the single cell culture. You see that the red one are conical shape, the orange one is cylindrical, and the, the green one are irregular. So each frame shows the coin in three different directions. Um, so what is here and what we see that each coin is unique. They have different sizes, number of gas molecules, but you know all these three uh, structures, they, they coexist. And there is, um, you know, this is still a mystery that uh, this is a nice commentary by uh, some quest on staff and say how to ask somebody how it. They say that you know uh, it's important to learn how the flat hexagonal um, capsid protein letters adjust to form the gradually curving body of the conical capsid. As you said, how can it be this uh, symmetry broken? So we model capsid proteins because they are identical. We also model a triangular prism just one single triangular, identical triangular prism. So if we put, if the equilibrium, so these are made of point masses in three layers, which are connected by springs. So the, the concept of a spring were chosen such that the system is isotropic. Then if you put five of them next together, if the equilibrium distance is the same, you get this shape. Alpha here is 60, and you can easily add the the sixth triangle and you get flat shapes. However, if the equilibrium length of the middle one or the, and the top one is a smaller, the spring is a smaller, so therefore alpha, when you put five of them alpha, the opening angle is less than 60. We need all atomic stick simulation to choose one to make it, decide to make it a hexamer or make it a pentamer. But we assume that there is a critical alpha so we can get, you know, pentamer, I mean, if alpha is smaller than a number, we make a pentomer. We attach the two edges and make a pentomer. Otherwise, we insert a triangle and make a hexamer. In that case, the shell will be curved. So we started adding one by one the, um, the triangles. So the attractive interaction between these subunits is weak. So we assume that at each triangle has enough time to move around to diffuse and find the place where it can make maximizes the number of the intermolecular bonds. But this is a deterministic world. It means that it, it's, it's, it moves around and finds the place that it uh, minimizes the energy. And the difference between this one and previous study is basically is that this is a non-equivalent. Once it's added, it cannot detach it. So we keep growing this capsid with the rule that I told you. So in this case, you see that I have four subunits. But this is for when they're small, for the case of small spontaneous radius. It means the radius of curvature is small. So after putting five, if alpha is still large, we can easily add another one, make it a hexamer. But at some point, alpha becomes small. So here, you see that once we add the, the fifth one, then we can attach it and make a pentamer out of it. So, and therefore, because these pentamers form close to each other, you will get a spherical shape. So this is a phase diagram. Here we have a spontaneous curvature on this, um, on this axis and looking at the shape. So we see here is when the spontaneous curvature, uh, the radius of the um, spontaneous curvature is small. Now I go to the other end of the spectrum and look at the um, larger radius of curvature. So when the radius of curvature is large, first the shell starts to grow as a spherical cap, and um, it grows with a similar speed, with the same speed in all directions, but at some point it's impossible to make um, a spherical shell from the, the hexamers. So therefore, here you can see how the symmetry is broken as we add more and more, uh, more and more triangle, you know, the shell becomes so, uh, the cast of uh, 
the cost of formation of, and in this case, the cost of formation of pentagon is so high because the, the radius of curvature is very large, so the, the, the spherical shell deforms and then form, which take this non-spherical shape, which becomes flatter in these two directions and curved in the middle. So you see that it grows like a rectangle. And it grows faster in the vertical direction because it's curved. So this is the formation of cylinder. So depending how fast it grows in each direction, we can have either cylinder, I mean, they have different chiral vector depending on the ratio of the width to length. I just want to tell you about the cone a little bit and then this one. So for cone, the radius of curvature is not as large as for the cylinder. Therefore, formation of pentagons is not forbidden. And therefore, so as it grows as a spherical shell, at some point it's possible it can form some pentagons to release the, uh, the straining energy. So it forms these pentagons, and therefore by the formation of pentagons, it introduces some curvature. So here is the stages of the growth of the conical capsis. So the darker color indicates more recent addition. So here you see that there were three, five, five, three pentagons, but as it grows, then the laws of elasticity take over. It doesn't like to bend, so it keeps growing, and then it keeps growing, and then it forms a conical shape. One nice thing here, that recently experimentalists have seen it, but they are waiting and they publish their work, is that, um, you know, here, as it grows, there is a uh, hydrophobic interaction that the two side of the cone, you know, attaches to each other. So there might be a line of defects appearing here. And it seems that the recent experiment shows that there is a line of defect on one side of the cone. So, and we could also see a tip, uh, because only limited deformation of subunits are allowed, so we have been able to see the holes and the tip of the cone in our simulation. So here is the phase diagram as a function of the spontaneous curvature. And, um, you see that in this side we have the spheres, and here we have cylinder and conical shape. The one that is missing actually has already been studied by Hicks and Henley. He calls it the potato regime. <laughs> and you see that the shape of each of the, I mean, the shape of the capsid depends on the angle of view. Mm -hmm. So I guess I.
Is there, a, is there a potentially a, uh, is there a functional role for the HIV virus in terms of having all these different confirmations? Uh, um, and um, does that play a role in why it's sort of difficult to come up with an appropriate um, vaccination against the HIV? It might, it might mutate easily. It does it mutate can, easily. Yeah, okay, it mutates right. easily and it's not, it shouldn't be hypostahedral, you know? It, yeah. And so, yeah. But no, they don't know why a child in particular took this shape. It's, it's, it's and it, are there other viruses that have this property of uh, multiple. multiple confirmations like this, or sort of a, a whole kind of panoply of confirmation? You know, uh, HIV belongs to a family of viruses called the retroviruses. Right. They are cancer, actually, they are cancer causing viruses because of the way they go inside our body. Those viruses, they. They, they all have that property. They all have this property. But CCMB in vitro, it can form different T numbers, or even if you mix capsid protein of CCMB with DNA, you can get, uh, you know, instead of alpha-cyhydrol shape, we can find a cylinder of capsids. But that relates directly to the question: uh, Does is the functionality related to the shape? Yeah. Are there uh, are there shapes that are especially functional and or do these, are these great big ones inert or what? Yeah, that's the question. That if, I mean, for alpha-sagidron one, you can say that this is free energy minimum, so it helps the evolution of the viruses. But why HIV? Yeah, that's really yeah. crazy. That, that's why a lot of have been asking us. But we were trying just to understand what is the physical uh, right. principles that gives rise to the shape of the which completely plays with ICAM since we're all about trying to identify organizing principles for uh, emergent properties of matter. Um, are there any other questions for you? Yes, come on. Um, so there were beautiful uh, studies of uh, crystalline organization of uh, tiny spherical colloidal particles on spherical surfaces. And you know, upon increasing number of those particles, people would see dislocations first, then uh, scars or brain boundaries. Uh, and I was wondering if you in certain regime could compare, you know, uh, your studies with those experimental studies, you know, uh, many different theoretical works. Right, like uh, the empirical study of Nelson and uh, Mark Boy, they all look at the scars. For viruses, the system is so small, they don't see scars. But I assume that it was the larger shells, and here we don't allow for seven holes. We have enough you know, to get the defects for the dissertation in the four and five and seven. Here we only have five holes. But uh, experimentally, I believe there were also uh, studies uh, on you know smaller number of particles where they also would see dislocations uh, rather than sparks. With the hard disk potential, hard disk. Well, those were experiments. Actually, I believe there was a ICAM uh, postdoctoral fellowship proposal a couple of years ago on this kind of work with uh, the Iowa State and uh, Syracuse. Uh, I have to try to remember. Yeah. Uh, okay. okay. I, have to, I have to try to remember. With, without, with who? With the. I have to try to remember. I can go back and look and see. 
Uh, well, why don't we, uh, we have scheduled right now a coffee break. Uh, after the coffee break, uh, Dave Britt will tell us about the